Hi there once again. This is Pastor Mike with Mountain View Baptist Church. So glad you decided to join us today on our YouTube channel. I've decided to take a look at something that has bothered me throughout the years, and that is things that Christians see in the Bible that bother them, that offend them, and that they desire to explain away, to sort of soften it out, get, get rid of those rough edges in the scripture and make it all nice and neat. And yet, I'm not always convinced that that's really what we're supposed to do. Maybe when the scripture ruffles our feathers, it's supposed to. Maybe we're supposed to think about it a little deeper. So I chose five things that Christians explain away that we can talk about today, that we can uh, delve into a little bit, taking a few minutes here, basically just to stir our curiosity and to make us think. If you have other things that perhaps you've heard explained away and didn't quite think it sat right with you, that it was explained away, hey, send us a comment, let us know, and maybe we'll address it on a future program. But for today, I'd like to start with Psalm 139, verses 21 through 22. And I want to talk about hate. There's a lot of hate going on right now, so perhaps this is a great subject to tackle. But we're going to hit it from an angle that I think Christians don't like to discuss. They don't like to embrace or admit or let's just see. It says, do I not hate them, O Lord? So here's the psalmist speaking. Don't I hate them, Lord? Well, who does he hate? Those who hate you. And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? Oh, I hate them with a perfect hatred, complete, unadulterated hate. That's the kind of hate I have for those who hate you. That's the kind of hate that I have for those who rise up against you, who oppose the Lord. I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies, the psalmist says. And so you'll hear this bantered about in church. Uh, perhaps a pastor uh, encounters it in his sermon. And he wants his congregation to know, to understand, hey, uh, by, by the rules of the New Testament, if you will, uh, as we have embraced Christ and the gospel, we are to love our enemies. We're to pray for those who spitefully use us and abuse us. We're to turn the other cheek and all of those things. We are to love. We're to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're to love those in the church so that the world will see our love for one another and know that we are the people of God. So we come to a verse like this. We're like, wait, 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 that, that is so Old Testament. D don't get carried away there with the psalmist. That's Old Testament. That's before grace. Well, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, so I don't know if it's really before grace, right? And Jesus, well, isn't he the Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever? I isn't he the same in the Old Testament and in the New and forever? I isn't that what we also preach. So what about this? What about this? How are we supposed to feel about those who hate the Lord, who oppose the Lord, who are against the Lord? Are they not to be our enemies? Doesn't the New Testament say that to be friends with the world is to be at enmity with God? Doesn't that mean we should be at enmity with the world? against the world system, against that which is in opposition to God. Another psalm, Psalm 5, in verse 5, speaking about the Lord, says that he hates all the workers of iniquity. In Psalm 11, we read that the wicked and the one who loves violence, his, the Lord, his soul hates. We are to be those who follow the Lord. We are supposed to be conformed into the image of Christ. We are to be those who follow God and are to be like God in righteousness and in justice. Yes, in mercy and love and peace and all of those things. But I don't think we should explain away 
verses like this, passages like this, and just say, well, this has nothing to do with a New Testament Christian. Because perhaps it does. Perhaps, like what Jesus said to the Ephesian church in the book of Revelation chapter 2, where he says, you know what? You, you have erred in some important uh, areas. There, there, there are some problems in your church, but there's something I want to commend you for. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. You, you hate that stuff. You hate what those people are doing, what those people are up to. And I think of how uh, the New Testament, Jude and, and Peter and others, how they speak about the false teachers. And when you read about how they speak about the false teachers, they're basically looking forward to their damnation, to their condemnation, to their destruction, to their, to their just reward for bringing heresy into the place of, uh, into the people of God. They're, they're looking forward to the day they will be destroyed. So maybe what this is really trying to get us to see and to understand is that we are not supposed to be friends friendly with the world as far as in their hatred towards God and their rebellion against God's word maybe we are supposed to be those who when we see people who are against the Lord who are his enemies who hate God who are in rebellion against him maybe it's okay for us to say you know what Lord you hate them and I hate them as well. Now, does that mean we're not going to preach the gospel? No, of course it doesn't. Because we hate them because they're in rebellion against God. They're sinners who need the gospel. But just because they need the gospel doesn't mean we compromise and say, Oh, yes, but, you know, Hitler was just misled. He's, he's, a, he's one of God's creatures. And so I can say, well, you know, it's okay to say I love Hitler. Uh, I don't know if that's how that works. Or, you know, Saddam Hussein, uh, he was just lost in sin, but, you know, we're called to love, right? Or Osama bin Laden, or think of some other monster. There are places for, and, and here's really the point, for righteous indignation towards sin and sinners. Righteous hatred towards sin and those who are in rebellion against God. It doesn't mean we don't sympathize in such a way where we preach the gospel as loud as we can, but it does mean we've drawn a line and we, we understand where the darkness is and where the light is. So this is something to think about. I'm not saying I have all the answers here about how to, how to make this fit into our Christian worldview. And what I mean by that is our New Testament worldview. But this is something certainly worth thinking about and not explaining away. Oh, well, the psalmist is just an Old Testament hater. Just a bunch of haters back there in the OT. They, they just, they didn't have the love of Christ in them. Well, I think we need to be careful. I think we need to think a little deeper about the truth of God's word and how God looks at sin and sinners. And now he has created the wicked for the day of destruction. And how he raised up Pharaoh that he might cast him down and destroy him. There are people, there are nations that God deals with out of his love. And then people and nations with whom God deals out of his hatred. Out of his righteous and just indignation. So, anyways... That's probably worth a comment or two. Why don't you leave this one and tell us what you think about what you're hearing, about thinking about the Bible and not explaining it away, but making it harmonize with itself. Not saying, well, this is done away with, unless you have a good reason to do so, but saying, okay, if God is unchanging and he recorded certain things in the Old Testament and then balanced them out with certain things in the New Testament, is it just a wash and we just forget we heard some things? Or is there some meaning yet to have in what the Old Testament says? And isn't there perhaps some New Testament passages that reflect that kind of a mindset? It doesn't mean I go around and I just hate 
anybody who doesn't come to church. I just hate everybody who rejects Jesus Christ. But there's a sense in my heart where, Lord, those who hate you, they are no friends of mine. I am not a friend of this world. And I hate that world system that is entrenched against you, that opposes you. Well, that's just number one. I spent too much time on that, I'm sure. But how about number two? Rahab's lie. Oh, well, she shouldn't have lied. Oh, yes, there in Joshua chapter 2, verses 3 through 7, there is the, uh, the, the spies, the, the two spies who have been sent out by Joshua, and they go to the harlot's house in Jericho. There's, I have never heard a Christian pastor rail against the spies making a stop at Jericho's whorehouse. I have only heard them rail against the harlot who lied about them being there. That, I'm sure, is another subject for another day. But here it is. Every time a Christian pastor has to face Rahab's lie, they... they, they I've, I've heard so many sermons where they just sort of paint Rahab in this bad light. She, she, was, she was unsaved. She didn't know the Lord. If she had, she would have known that lying is wrong. She shouldn't have lied. Uh, she should have trusted the Lord to figure it out. This is ridiculous, right? I mean, Rahab is in not only the lineage of Christ in Matthew chapter 1, but she's also plainly stated by name in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. That great, that great chapter of faithful people, that great chapter of examples of faith. There's Rahab. Why is she there? She's there because of her story in Joshua chapter 2. She's there because she hid and concealed the spies, which was against the law of the king of Jericho. The king says, hey, Rahab, we know the guys went to your house, as men are apt to do here in Jericho, Miss Harlot. So where are they? Oh, they, they did come. Yes, they were here, but, oh, you just missed them. Maybe if you take off after them, you might just be able to catch them. She lies. And this is what gets her into the Hall of Faith. So why are we criticizing what she did here? Why are we criticizing what the Bible lifts up? Well, obviously, we don't want our kids lying to each other, right? Well, the New Testament, the Bible says, don't bear false witness. And probably in, in the Ten Commandments, it has sort of a, a, a legal feeling to it. You know, don't go to court and bear false witness against somebody. And then the New Testament makes very clear we are not to lie to one another. Christians should not lie to each other. However, this completely neglects the important fact that life was saved by her lie. I mean, are we to go to the Holocaust and the people that hid Jews in their basement or wherever they hid them and then lied about hiding them? Should they have trusted the Lord and said, yes, I do have Jews in my basement, and I'm trusting the Lord to protect them as you go down to arrest them. No way. Okay, God desires that we protect life. Rahab protected life. And the Bible never throws a shadow on her actions in protecting life. The Bible never says she didn't trust God. The Bible says she's in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11 because she had faith in God. So quit explaining this away, Christian. Quit explaining this away, Pastor. Why don't you explain it in context? Here is the context. It was life and death. For her to tell the factual truth would have been death to the spies. For her to lie about hiding the spies was to preserve their lives. And that is the point. That's the moral of this story. And that's why hiding Jews in the Holocaust was just as moral, even if you had to lie about it, as Rahab's action here in Joshua chapter 2. I won't belabor the point further than that, except to say, quit throwing shade on Rahab. 
Yes, the woman was a harlot. <laughs> and she lied about hiding spies. But she found her way into the congregation of the Lord. She found her way into the genealogy of Christ and into the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 because she preserved life by her actions and by her words, pushing away the enemy so that the spies could have time to get away. So number three, Romans chapter 9, verse 13. There's a lot in Romans chapter 9 that, that is highly controversial, that we could talk about, that we could have fun with, but here's something that people explain away. As it is written, Paul says, Jacob I have loved, speaking about God, God says, Jacob I have loved, but Esau, Esau I have hated. Romans 9, 13, quoting Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. So, I hear pastors go over this, and right away, they're uncomfortable. Well, why does God say, I love Jacob, and I hated his brother Esau? And we come up with all these explanations to explain it away, to, to, to make it land a little softer, to got to soften out and sand down those rough edges here. And often, what I've heard said is, well, the Lord really loved Jacob, and he just kind of loved Esau less. Like, next to Jacob, the love that God had for Esau kind of resembled hate because he loved Jacob so much and loved Esau less, like way less. It's like he hated him. And so it wasn't real hate. God didn't hate Esau. He just loved him less. Well, uh, except for the fact in Malachi in the Hebrew and in uh, Romans in the Greek, the word is, I hated Esau. So, should we explain that away? Or should we explain what it means? Should we explain it away? Or should we explain what it means? Should we explain that God had chosen Jacob from his mother's womb, before the twins were born? That God had chosen Jacob and that before they were ever born, God had rejected Esau. Should we not explain the text in the context of Romans chapter 9? How God has ordained his love upon some. And as he explains a few verses later, there are some vessels which have been created for destruction. Yes, vessels which God... Uh, uses to show his mercy and pours out his love and blesses and other vessels that he uses to show his judgment, his justice, and uses them for destruction. It's sometimes easier to explain something away. And, and maybe as a pastor might go through Romans chapter 9, they'll just start explaining all kinds of stuff away because they, they don't want to sort of admit what is right there on the surface, and so they sort of dig around it so they can go around it and go underneath it and get out of it and explain it away so that we don't have to stand there and say, hey, God says he loved Jacob, even though he was a conniver and a deceiver, and yet he hated Esau, who was the legitimate firstborn. We don't want to talk about what that means. We don't want to talk about how Paul uses it in chapter 9. We don't want to talk about this idea that there are people all over the world. There are people that you know, that I know. There are people all around us. Everyone in the world falls into one of these categories. They either have the love of God resting upon them, or they have the hatred of God. They will either end up saved in heaven, safe and secure, or they will end up damned for eternity suffering the torments of hell. We don't want to talk about that. And so, well, he just loved Esau less, you know, <laughs> just less. I mean, it, God just loves everybody, right? God's just mushy about everyone and everything. He never saw a single person he hated. Let's get rid of those passages in both the Old Testament and in the New about God's hate, about God's wrath, about God's retribution, about God's judgment, about all of these things. Let's just wash it away sweep it under the rug, and let's just say, well, he just loves those people less. Those people who are 
raised up for destruction. Well, I think you can see my point here. So let's not explain things away. Let's work with them. Let's, let's get at the theological meaning behind them. Number four, Matthew chapter 19, verse 23, classic. Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. How hard is it, Jesus? Well, let me tell you, it is easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle, whatever that euphemism means, people talk about it, but the point is, it is real hard. But it's easier for that to be done. Whatever it is and how hard it is, much easier for that than for a rich man to enter heaven. Now, quickly, American Christians especially, and I'm, I'm sure pastors around the world, we quickly want everybody to be immediately at ease with whatever wealth they possess. Whether they're middle class, lower class, or way in the upper class wealthy, whoever they are, we don't want anybody to be ashamed of their money, of their wealth, of their resources, of capitalism, of Wall Street, of anything that is making anybody money. We don't want to have people feeling embarrassed about that, being ashamed of that, or casting riches in any light that is anything but favorable. And so pastors just scramble. I've heard it and I've seen it done. Explaining why, well... This doesn't mean that rich people can't get into heaven. This doesn't mean that riches are evil. This doesn't mean this. This doesn't mean that. It's not really hard for a rich person to get to heaven. In fact, if you just come forward and say the sinner's prayer, you're in. It's easy. Grace is easy. Well, you've probably heard your own sermons. Maybe some of you have preached them. And we don't want to think about, well, the love of money Oh, it's the root of all kinds of evil. And this love, love of money and riches, is something for which some have strayed from the faith. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Paul says, again in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, he speaks to the rich, right, to the pastor, Pastor Timothy, and says, command those who are rich in this present age, be careful. Don't be haughty. Don't be prideful. Don't trust in uncertain riches. Make sure you are trusting in God. I mean, this is a stern warning. This is, this is sort of a, a scary thing. Hey, Timothy, I know you got some rich people in your church. Command them to be careful because it's hard for a rich man to enter into heaven and they need to be careful. Oh, there's the deceitfulness of riches the Bible talks about. You've got to be careful. It is a snare. It is a trap. You don't want to be caught up in it. But yet, in America and perhaps in all the Western world, we love money. We don't care that it's the root of all kinds of evil. We love it. We can't wait to get our next lotto ticket. We, we, we can't wait for our next raise. Well, we can't wait for our tax return if we're getting money back from the government. We can't wait for the next stimulus check. Money, 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 making it rain. We love it. We have a problem when we face the words of the gospel, and when we face the words of Christ and the words of the New Testament apostles, and they are at odds with our philosophy. They are at odds with how we think and how we feel and how we live and how we move. Well, there's a problem with us. James, what does he say about the rich? He says, you who are rich should be weeping and howling in fear. And then he goes on, from James chapter 5, you can check it out yourself. He says, be careful, be careful. Riches, while in and of themselves inherently are not evil, but the problem is when you connect riches with a human soul, a human heart, it tends to equal greed. It tends to puff up with pride. It tends to develop things that are in complete opposition to Christianity, to the Lord, to the gospel, to grace. So we need to be careful. 
And instead of trying to convince everybody that riches are great because we all want it, we need to say that according to the Bible, we need to be real careful. And if we are rich, I'm not, so I don't have to worry about this, but some of you might be. The Bible is warning you, be careful. Make sure you are trusting in God. It goes on to say, hey, make sure that you are sharing your wealth and using it for God's purposes. Oh, well, no one's going to tell me what to do with my money. See? It's already corrupted you. Anyways, we should not be smoothing this over. Rather, we should be dealing with these rough edges. It is hard for a rich man to enter into heaven. We need to be careful about riches, and we need to be careful for us who don't have it if we are after it. Because that is a snare. That is dangerous. That leads to destruction. So, we're not saying rich people can't get to heaven. We're not saying rich people can't come to church. I mean, we have New Testament instruction about rich people in church. So clearly, you can have rich people in church. Uh, Nicodemus was rich. He turned to the Lord. Joseph of Arimathea was rich. He turned to the Lord. Uh, Zacchaeus, filthy rich, turned to the Lord. So we're not saying it's impossible. We're saying Jesus is giving us a stern warning. And the rest of the New Testament bears up and supports that warning and we must be careful be careful you who consider yourselves rich for you are poor jesus says in revelation well anyways number five last but not least on our list ephesians 5 22. oh gonna get in some hot water here it says wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Wives submit. Wives submit. Now, I've heard it a million times. I've read a million commentaries. Well, it is not really saying that wives are supposed to, like, submit uh, or obey. It's kind of like, you know, um, something else. <laughs> I mean, people get all tongue-tied. They go a verse earlier where it says we should submit to one another. And see, see, it's not about wives submitting to their husbands. It's about everyone, husbands and wives included, submitting to one another. So wives are submitting to their husbands in as much as husbands are submitting to their wives. So it's really a wash. Peter, he, bear, he, he, he bears down on this, though. He doubles down. Peter, in his first letter, chapter 3. He talks about wives submitting to their husbands, and he explains how there's a, a character of a godly woman, like the holy women of old who submitted to their husbands. He, he <laughs> speaks of Sarah. Remember how she called Abraham her husband? She said, Lord, or in our vernacular, sir, or master. So we get uncomfortable because we're Americans. Uh, we've, uh, you know, we're well beyond the feminist movement, and, uh, you know, we're just uncomfortable here. We don't know what, this is old-fashioned, right? This is some of that obsolete uh, New Testament stuff, first century. It, it just doesn't really apply anymore, and so we got to be careful. And it really shows where our priorities are, where our thinking is, how we view the world, because nobody bats an eye when husbands are commanded to love their wives as Christ loved his church. No, nobody seems to care about that. That's easy, right? I mean, look, it just says to husbands to love your wives. <laughs> That's all it says. Husbands love your wives, but the wife, oh, you've got to submit to your husband. You've got to bow down. You've you got to get on bended knee. You've got to do whatever he says. And so what we end up doing, once again is explaining away the verse rather than attempting to understand its meaning, rather than attempt to understand what Paul is saying, what the Holy Spirit is saying about Christian, not worldly, but Christian union, Christian marriage. Yes, a wife, a, a, a wife of faith, a godly woman, according to 1 Peter 3. A godly wife 
she yields willfully to the authority of her husband. And she's not afraid to say so. Why does she do this? Because in the beginning, God made them male and female. Jesus talks about that. And God brought Adam and Eve together. But he didn't make them at the same time or in the same fashion. No, he created Adam from the dust of the earth. And then he took from Adam's side and he fashioned for him a wife, a woman. And then he brought them together. And as we get into the New Testament, we see that the wife is to come under the covering and the headship and the protection of her husband. And she is to, yes, yield to him, submit to him, and love him, and nurture him, and support him, and help him. And then Adam, and then the man, the man is supposed to love his wife. And we're not just talking about, oh yeah, I love my wife. Oh, oh, yeah, I'm married to her, so I must love her. No, we're talking about a deliberate, sacrificial, self-giving love. We're, we're talking about a love that is of the entire being. A man is to love his wife. How? Like Jesus loves his church. Jesus who gave himself for his church completely entirely, selflessly, sacrificially. A man is to give himself and to give of himself fully and completely to his wife. And so the wife who is submitting to her husband is submitting to this man who was called to adore her and to love her and to embrace her and they are to grow together in their love for one another. Yes, they have different roles. Roles that are topsy-turvy in our, in our modern era, aren't they? But the Bible's a traditional book, the way we think of tradition, right? It's old-fashioned. And God says that the woman has a womanly place. And the man has a manly place. And there's to be a certain role that is played by the man and a certain role that is fulfilled by the woman. And ultimately, and in general, there's a family that's created. From the union of the man and his wife come forth the children. And there is a home that is established. And there is a home that must be cared for and protected and there's a home that must be nurtured and taken care of and loved. And, and these two, the man and woman, are to come together so that this family can be the perfect picture of God's love in the world. That, that's what's supposed to be going on here. It, it's, it's that American mindset, is it? Well, I don't submit to nobody. No one's going to tell me what to do. I don't care if he is my husband. I don't care if he's got a ring on his finger or a ring on my finger. I'm, a, I'm my own person. Well, yeah, that's the world's philosophy. That's not biblical philosophy. We, we are not independent any longer. We are one. And a Christian marriage isn't going to work properly unless there's union and unity the way God has ordained it. And so we got to get rid of this idea of, oh, I've got to explain this away because women in my church aren't going to want to hear about submitting to their husbands. Well, maybe if we preach as hard on the role of a true husband and the place of a real man in the family, and perhaps if men start taking their role more seriously, well, it takes two to tango, doesn't it? And God has called the man to love his wife. It's a command. And God has called the woman and commanded her to submit to her husband. And as long as we see this in the 
perspective of feminism, of Americanism, of whatever other kind of ism we're living under or in, and instead of seeing it through the lens of Scripture, it's always going to look ugly. It, it's it's going to bring out that anger within us that wants our individual rights. But if we set that aside and remember we're citizens of heaven and we're followers of Christ, well, all of a sudden, this takes on a whole different hue. All of a sudden, there's a whole different meaning here to be understood. And it's not something that a Christian woman will push away. Yeah, a worldly woman, an unsaved woman, a non-Christian woman is going to look at this and never understand it because there's no context. But a Christian woman with the context of Scripture, the context of the gospel, the context of the church is going to see this in a beautiful light the way Peter attempts to describe it in, in his first letter, chapter 3, where it's a beautiful thing. It's an admirable thing. And Peter pushes it a step further, by the way. When you go over there, he talks about those women who are married to men who are not Christians and who are not submitted to the command of Christ to love their wives as Jesus loves his church. And he says, in those marriages... Perhaps the man will be one to Christ through the submissive love of his wife. So, instead of explaining things away, maybe it's time we got to the heart of the meaning of what the Bible is trying to tell us. I'm Pastor Mike from Mountain View Baptist Church, and these are just words.